Vroom, 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 vroom. Oh, no, don't go that way. Ah, it's a hospital. Vroom, vroom. Oh. Uh, welcome to ECE 2002. Howdy, everybody. Welcome back to EC 2002. Uh, today we're going to do lecture 23, and let's get going. So, finally, we've arrived at one of these critical moments here that we're so happy to see, um, the complex plane and stability. What we're going to be doing in this chapter is looking at what are called poles and zeros. So, we're finally going to explore what our, in, our, our transfer function is in the fun, uh, frequency space and start to describe some of the behaviors that we see there, uh, including today we're going to talk about stability. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do is recall what we already know. So what do we know? We know that a system, a linear system, is defined by this thing that we've called the impulse response, right? And the impulse response is just that thing when... Uh, which is when it's convolved with the input uh, gives me the output. Okay. We also found out that there's a new way to look at HT in the frequency domain by taking its Laplace transform. Right. All we did was we just took the Laplace of the impulse response and we got our transfer function back out. In the new domain, we saw that uh, the input, the Laplace transform of the input times the transfer function gives me the output. And we also recognize that um, pretty much everything that we do in the um, in the frequency domain it can be represented as a rational expression or one polynomial over another. And five, we touched on this briefly, but haven't really explicitly dug into it too much, which is what we're going to do today. Um, we looked at the concept of zeros and poles. Uh, zeros are derived from those roots which occur. Uh, up in the numerator, and poles are those roots which occur in the denominator for various values of s. Okay, so here's a form, a generic form of our polynomial. We have some constant k out here that's going to become important later on. Um, but for right now, we just want to look at the values of s which do different things. And up here you can see I've denoted this as z1, z2, etc. up here for z, and then p1, p2, etc. on the denominator as a correspondence to that. Um, so let's just dig right into some examples here. This should be very straightforward. If you've had any basic um, classes that they did a lot with polynomials, usually algebra does this, um, but if not, that's okay. Um, so zeros here, uh, we have a multiplicity of 1 and a multiplicity of 2 uh, up top. Uh, 5 has a multiplicity of 2 or order of 2. You can say it that way as well. Either way is fine, honestly. Um, and then down in the denominator, the poles are demarked uh, in our graphic, which is coming up next, with an x. And they're going to have uh, negative 4 of order 3. Notice here the degree 3 polynomial, or sorry, the, the degree 3. And then uh, our two complex ones. Noting here to be careful about the uh, sign on on j with respect to what we see here. So this is actually a negative and a negative. This is a negative and then a positive because the sign's going to switch on you um, for your input to be able to be zero down there. Now, one thing that you should note right away is the term zero makes sense, right? The term zero essentially means um, that the entire function is going to go to zero at that point. Why do we call it a pole? Well, what the heck kind of sense does that make? Well, if you think about it, if I have 1 over uh, s, and actually this is probably the easiest function to graph, we're just going to actually do this as 1 over t even, so you can just see something kind of simple. Um, what does this look like as t gets very, 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 very small, close to 0? Well, it's going to go towards infinity, right? And then what happens as it gets out to infinity? Well, it actually has an end behavior that takes it down here to, to 0, as a matter of fact, in its height as we go to infinity. And then uh, you should recognize that the counterpart here is down here. That's fine. It doesn't really matter. Um, th my main point here is, what does this look like? Well, I like to think about it this way. <laughs> There's a pole right here. And actually, if we had a t squared right here, right, it forms a little tent. And what do tents need? Tents need poles, right? 
Okay. Well, now you know. Anyways, um, I'm not sure that's why that's called that, um, but it is funny to me. So uh, I hope it helps you remember which ones are poles and which ones are zeros. The things that make it go off to infinity or explode are the things that are poles and the things that make it go to zero are zeros. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Let's graph these uh, poles and zeros in the complex plane now. Oh, look, everything's already done for us. Um, this is probably going to be a short lecture. I'm going to do a MATLAB uh, portion at the end here, so I have no idea how long everything's going to take. Um, I want to try to show you guys some of the functionality of, of the pull zero plotter, which I'm going to post on the Brightspace page under the supplemental materials. Um, if you have MATLAB and you know how to use it at all, even just a tiny, tiny bit, you definitely want to download this one. Uh, it'll probably come in handy for the final as well. So in lieu of having to do some kind of uh, project, your final is probably going to require you to do some work that's outside the bounds of what you normally do in a timed exam, meaning maybe just a tiny bit of coding or a little bit of um, work to show me how you get to a, an answer. But in doing so, you'll, you'll be able to use uh, scripting of some kind whether that's Python or MATLAB or, or LT Spice or whatever, I don't, I won't really care, but I'll, I'll figure out more details as I get closer towards the, uh, the end here, but do expect some problems like that in there. Um, and if I end up doing that, I'll give you guys probably a little bit more lead time on, uh, on the final exam. That way you have some time to actually try to work through some of those things in there, um, or give you kind of like part A, part B, of, uh, of the exam. So don't worry, it'll be fun. It'll, it won't be too bad. It'll be relevant to what we've done and, and just kind of exploring some things that you can do. Okay. And it'll probably use some of the scripts that I give you guys. So no big deal. Very easy. All right. So here we have our, uh, let's start with our zeros. We had a zero at negative five and a zero at three. Yep. Right here. And, uh, and then our poles are sitting right here. So what's going to end up happening here is when we look at the complex plane, what we're going to do is probe um, different values here for our... Uh, we're essentially going to take a vector here and kind of stretch and skew it and see what we can do, right? Let me do it like this. Oops, that's not going to work. Anyways, sorry. Try, I tried to do a fun graphic. It's not going to be fun. So... Eventually, where we're going is looking at this and then measuring it off of these poles and zeros. Now, there's not generally going to be that many of them to have to work with, so don't worry. But um, that's what this is going to be useful for, is measuring in a very geometric way um, what's going on in the complex plane. Okay, so let's see here. Why do we care? Well, actually, it gives us the form of the natural response for the circuit for the poles um, uh, that come from arbitrary inputs, right? We have these A, B, C, D coefficients that are unspecified. But um, by and large, if I have this equation, oops, this equation here, I'm going to get a solution that's a homogeneous or natural solution of this form. Why? Um, well, because when I break it up, my final form is going to look like this, right? And so this is that frequency shift of by four. Let me use a different color so you guys can follow it a little bit easier. I have a frequency shift by four, right? Plus a frequency shift by four, but I'm taking its derivative. So uh, when you when you have those extra uh, bits there, you're going to have uh, t's and, and so forth. So that's what's going on here. We have uh, duplicates of everything that's going on. You'll notice these are like these duplicate roots that are that are occurring here. And then for uh, terms like this, we know that those are a sine or cosine function, so we have to accommodate the solution form for sine and cosine as well. So I note here that S is in the numerator of the final form. So if you were to expand this out, um, you have some S's up there. You could also do the um, do the partial fraction method by, you know, 
actually adding these together and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, just be careful. You know, we know how to do the partial fraction stuff by now, so you should be a pro. Okay, another uh, quick example, just kind of make sure that you get the, the whole picture here. Let's say that HS is equal to K, uh, S plus 2, S plus 3, over S plus 4, S plus 5. Okay? Uh, so the partial fraction would produce um, HG that would include a constant... So when I do the partial fraction expansion of this, it's going to include some kind of constant at the end. That's fine. Um, but what we also end up with here is the natural response. So the natural portion of this is going to be equal to something of this form. 5t kut. So you should be able to start seeing these things happening now. And start... Now, finally, seeing these as some kind of frequency, okay? Because that's what they really are at the end of the day. Okay, well, let's turn to the second topic of today, uh, which is the concept of stability. So there's really not too much material in this. Um, I think the bigger portion of this section is more um, homework and getting familiar with that. Okay, so most of the homework for this is pretty straightforward. It's going to deal a lot with the concepts of stability that we're going to be talking about here next. Um, and just doing some, uh, some plots, doing a little, little quick plot question that we have here as well. So yeah, it's, pretty straightforward stuff. I know the last chapter had a lot of, a lot of questions in it. Um, don't be put off by that too much. Just it's there to give you extra practice. Okay. So don't feel like you have to, you know, accomplish all of those in a single day. Um, but you should be trying to press on it as hard as you can, uh, to make sure that you do well for the, the quizzes and the exam. Um, and the more you practice, the more you're going to learn and get out of this course. Okay. So we'll come back to those uh, practice problems here in a little bit. But first, we probably need to nail down this concept of stability. So the whole point of stability is we don't need to actually uh, compute the natural, natural response to be able to draw conclusions regarding the stability of that circuit. So Bebo is not a, not a funny name for a robot. It's actually bounded input. bounded output. And I like to put a little arrow in here because I think it exemplifies what's actually going on with uh, Bebo. And this is, my pen got stupid on me. There we go. So really what this comes down to is it's a, it's a discussion about energy. Okay. So for finite energy, we should get a finite output. What, what do I mean by that? Well, the best way to think about it is in terms of the amplitude or how much area you kind of have under the curve. You guys have done some some kind of power analysis for different things and measuring power and energy um, from a physics standpoint, hopefully at least a little bit. Um, but the formal definition here looks something like this. If I take some kind of input and I look at it over all time and it's, you know, not infinite... <laughs> Uh, then if y is equal to the convolution of some system with that bounded input, right, this is bounded, then y must also be bounded. And there are a lot of different ways to define bounding. So, it, this is just for our Bebo purposes. This is a, a side math discussion here. But when you're talking about the bounded nature of sets or the bounded nature of, of sequences or how they bounce around and eventually converge to something, there's a lot of different ways to define it, okay? There's not just one right way. So if part of your confusion comes from like, oh, what, where does that definition come from? Well, it's 
kind of made up a little bit, <laughs> but it's a convenient definition, right? That's really what it boils down to is that these definitions are convenient terms for things that we observe working well in nature. Okay. So that's where, that's where this is coming from. Um, but yeah, suffice it to say, if you understand the core concept, which is, hey, this is finite, it's bounded, it's not going off to la-la land, um, but I'm getting outputs that are going off to la-la land, then you have a problem, right? You, you're Bebo unstable. And sometimes you are on a fine line between being stable and unstable. Um, we call that marginally stable. His terminology should sound a lot like our, uh, uh, our damped and underdamped and overdamped and etc. systems, okay? So don't be surprised if there's going to be some overlap here as we progress. So, Bebo stable if, and here's where this overlap is going to come in, all poles lie in left plane, left half plane, excuse me, I guess that's what we're calling it these days, left half plane, that is, oops, i.e., uh, the real portion of the pole, recall that this is, this is this operator that just looks at the real part of a number, so if you have a plus bi, this just strips out the a, okay, or A plus JB, whatever we want to say. I know there's some engineers that really get, uh, you know, turned in a bunch. It's, it's J, it's J. And the, I think the emphasis on it being J is, is only because it's so dumb, because electrical engineering is the only field that uses J. And oh, by the way, we run over ourselves all the time and trip over using the same notation over and over again. Oops. Yeah that's an output and then this is also the impedance or the uh, the admittance yeah good job okay we really clarified our terms here guys <laughs> we really need to keep our i's and j's separate like it's super important like we're like we're getting confused over here come on really you couldn't just stick with i okay my rant's over <laughs> now that i've now that i've uh proselytized heresy over here oh boy tom's gonna lynch me oh well i don't care yeah, just don't go telling your other electrical engineering teachers that uh, the Art Turlip said it was cool you could use I. Uh, or do. That's fine. I, I always like to pick a fight. Let's go figure out what the hell stability <laughs> means. <laughs> um, so this has to be, this is equal to the this, this sigma, of course, right? Uh, sigma I, that's the real portion, and that's got to be less than uh, zero. What does this look like? Well, let's go back to our little diagram. So that means that anything that is Bebo stable has X's, which live over here. They have to live on this side of the line. If they live on the line, we call them marginally stable. And if they live over here, then they're unstable. It's really just that simple. Okay? Notice what this means. Okay? You remember what we talked about? You guys, see, I've set you guys up so well for this, okay? In, in other versions of 20002, you don't see this. But we've set this up perfectly. Why? Because we already know that when I have my roots, uh, we're going to sidestep the whole frequency domain thing here for a second. But when I have roots living here and here, we know that that's an underdamped system. We know that when we have the repeated roots, right, for that second order ODE, that it's a un, uh, excuse me, it's a uh, critically damped system. And then as they move out to here and here, I end up with a... Uh, underdamped system, right? But it's still, it may be underdamped, right? It still has these oscillations, but it still is converging. All of these different things that we've explored were converging, except for the, that's right, the undamped, which lived right here. So when I got to the undamped, right, it was just this sine cosine thing. And sometimes they had some funky patterns, depending on how you built it. This is my robotic Bebo heartbeat. Beep boop, beep boop, beep boop. Okay. Losing my mind. Um, but anyways, uh, it was stable, right? It didn't, it didn't launch off into oblivion. And then what we, what we saw was, as I moved over here into this region, this was the no-no land, right? No, don't go over here. 
well, then you had stuff explode, and that was bad. It's also bad in terms of stability because what we end up with are things that um, don't retain the properties that we put into the system. They, they rush off and, uh, and explode. So, so let's look at something that is, in fact, unstable. So let's see here. Example. So h of s is equal to 1 over s squared plus 4 squared. Okay, my roots for this one uh, look like what? Well, this is actually, um, so this one would be marginally unstable because my two roots are right on that pole. I have s plus j4 and s minus j4. Um, so if you were to plot this out, you know, there's no real component to this, right? There's just a pole here and here at uh, minus, oops, plus 4j and minus 4j. And although we call these marginally stable, they're actually more like marginally unstable, right? Um, so the book notes, uh, this particular transfer function will produce a natural response having a term in the form uh, k sine of 4t. And notice that frequency of 4 in there. Let me write that out. It'll produce a solution like this. Um, and it also includes... Uh, Therefore, any input that also includes a sine 4t term will produce an output having a term of the form t sine 4t. Recall that when our input frequency matches our, uh, our I'm going to get ahead of myself, our, uh, the frequency that's in our transfer function, I'm, I'm running out of vocabulary here, that's why we have the next chapter coming up, uh, then what we end up with is this extra form, and this, by the way, does not converge, right? As t grows larger, we have the function uh, t multiplied by a sine function. What is that going to do? Well, it's going to do this. It's going to make it very, very large, okay? So that's no bueno. So marginally stable is not really a great definition because what you end up having is, depending on the input, it can actually make it eh, kind of kind of work or mm, that's not really working out for us, guys. So we got to be careful about how we define things and, and, and look at stuff here. The homework problems provide a lot of great examples of this, and uh, you'll, you'll be able to see it you know, pretty easily because there's not too much, um, too much tricky in there. So significance of zeros. Um, so the poles of the system provide that critical information about the stability of the system. Um, the zeros don't affect that behavior. But what they do indicate is which form of output terms will not be generated. So, the, and I'm pulling this straight out of the book because um, I think it's pretty well written. Uh, so, for example, we have a transfer function for which the numerator contains the factors s plus b. Um, then any input of that form, so let me go ahead and pull up a new page here so I can kind of write this out. So suppose we have... S plus B, da, 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 da. oops, whoa, where did you go? Come back here. S plus B in the numerator and then some other stuff down here. Um, then any input like K E to the minus B T U T. Notice here that this is at that special frequency of B, right? When we transform this in uh, to the uh, into the uh, frequency domain, what's going to happen? Well, we should end up with a 1 over s plus b in the denominator, right? Okay, so what do you expect to happen here with this guy? That's right. They, they should kind of cancel out. So let's see what we end up with here. Um, so it says the uh, will not produce a forced response at this frequency given that the s plus b factor in the denominator of the inputs of the plus transform will cancel with the s plus b factor in the numerator of the transfer function. Aha, exactly. So let's write this out a little bit more explicit, explicitly with a proper example. So the book provides this nice one here. Um, and this really is starting to get to the heart of, of what we're going to talk about next time. Fine, I'll say the word. It's resonance. Resonance, resonance, resonance. Everyone got that? Okay, good. It's a lot of fun. I, I like talking about the the resonance of circuits and stuff like that. Because you really start to get into what all this is good for with any kind of, you know, oscillating um, 
signals. Like, who cares? You can oscillate a signal all day long. Why do I care? Um, well, if you can design hardware that does different things to different kinds of oscillations, and you can write out math equations that define that world, it's like having your own little wizard textbook. Because um, you can magically do things to, to things that people don't even dream of most of the time, which is really cool. That's what makes our discipline awesome and all the math worthwhile. Um, so we're about to be, get rewarded here in the next couple sections. So as we already have been quite a bit. So for uh, S equals negative 2 and S equals negative 3, we have our two zeros. And uh, these zeros, it says, will not alter the form of the response for any input, uh, like if we had, say, e to the minus t u t, right? No, no big deal. Those are fine. But um, they will alter the response of something like, um, let's say we had e to the minus 3 t u t, right? Why? Because of this frequency. So that frequency comes in, if I take this into the Laplace domain, let's say that this was my, uh, I'll just call it x of s, okay, my, my input function, then this in the Laplace form is going to be 1 over s plus 3. You guys know that. And then recall that when I do my output, ys is just equal to hs times xs. And so you can see the problem here. This is going to multiply through, oops, s plus 2, s plus 3. Oopsies, those cancel out. And so all that behavior that I had around this zero, you know, that nice little, it's got to go to zero at that point. Uh-uh, not anymore. Because my input took that away. My input took out my behavior at that frequency. Just kind of weird. So rather, they'll only see the natural response. Uh, okay, so book says, our output will not incorporate such a form. So it won't have that, uh, yeah. So our output won't have a form with this factor in it, right? So when we finally get to making this this output function and put it back into the, the time space, it's not gonna have that term in there anymore like we had before. So you recall that the natural is, you know, corresponding to the homogeneous and the, um, the particular is corresponding to my forcing input. Um, well, in this case, that forcing input frequency is disappearing because of what's going on with my other zeros. Okay, does that make sense? So they're kind of acting like these little notches that say, hey, you can, you know, you may ride, but you can't be exactly two feet tall or, uh, <laughs> or, or we won't see you in the final solution. I'm sorry. Okay. So something to keep in mind when we're designing systems and how we put in uh, different signals that have different properties, different frequency properties, will really impact, um, will have different impacts based on how our circuit is designed, really. Okay, that's enough of that. Uh, I'm going to jump right into the MATLAB now. Hopefully my computer doesn't explode. I'm trying to run MATLAB and do screen recording and running this PDF at the same time. Uh, this Mac is getting kind of old, it served me well, but uh, let's hope we can make it through. Okay, so actually what I wanted to do with uh, the rest of our time here today is just look at just the MATLAB, okay? So what we're going to do is do the homework, but we're going to cheat. I love cheating. <laughs> no, I hate cheating. But this kind of cheating is good. It's fun. It teaches us a lot of stuff. So we're going to actually take these examples and we're going to plot them in MATLAB and get a little bit of a preview for next time. We're going to be using this plotter probably at least another time or two uh, while we're here. And I designed this actually back when uh, when I was TAing for Tom in 2019 and uh, during the fall course for that. So this is almost a year old now. Uh, I think it still works. Let's give it a go. Um, let's just run it real quick here and make sure everything's working. Okay. All right, cool. So the pole zero plot is uh, the first thing that gets plotted. Um, don't worry about that other plot just yet. We'll talk more about that uh, next time and, and in future uh, classes. But for right now, I just want you to get used to seeing stuff in the complex plane. That's the whole focus of today is just where is stuff in the complex plane and why do I care? Um, so here you can see we had an input. Um, I'll run through the inputs for you guys just, just so you have kind of a, a feel. Uh, theta P, I'm not sure. Let me, let me figure out where that 
comes into play. Oh, I see. Okay, that's for something else. Uh, we'll get to that stuff later. This is a fun way to to design some pulls. So anyways, um, we have our zero here. We have a singular zero, which means that we have just s plus one on top, right? Because our zero is minus one. So in order to make it a zero, it would need to have, you know, s plus one minus one input makes a zero. Okay. Um, our uh, our two poles are at negative six plus eight i and negative six minus a i. 8i, not ai, noting here the uh, complex conjugates of each other. Um, they always are going to be this mirror image across this real, uh, I, yeah, across the real line. Okay, so this is really not easy to draw out here, but this imaginary is going up and down this way. All right, these are the imaginary numbers going this way. So your imaginary axis is right here, even though it points to RES. So this should actually be like up here and this guy should be over here, but you know what it's supposed to be. Um, so this is all real numbers here and these are all imaginary numbers here, okay? Nope, here we go, we got the fan kicking on already. All right, so log scaling, that's for a future thing. Don't worry about that. All you need to worry about is this stuff here and just click out of the other one. Um, if you want, I encourage you guys to take a look at the coding on this and make sure that I didn't mess anything up. Uh, as it turns out, this whole portion here um, just generates the uh, the plot in the complex plane. It's really not too bad once you see what's what's going on there. There's a little some a uh, little bit of goofy stuff here with how to do the plots of where the X's and O's go. Um, you know, it's kind of a goofy tic-tac-toe game, and you have to shift some stuff over. So don't worry about some of those constant factors in there. They're just to Make sure stuff is aligned nicely um, because they weren't sitting in the right spot when we first pl started plotting them out. Um, so like good engineers, we just kind of, yeah, you know, about this much. It'll work. Okay, so I got my optional uh, old man sizing on here um, so that you can see all the, <laughs> all the fonts and stuff for, uh, for putting it in like a book or something like that. Um, I think my eyes were giving me trouble that day, so I, I put those in there because I couldn't read anything. And the vision kind of comes and goes a little bit. Okay, uh, let's see here. Is there anything else I want to talk about in the code specifically before we jump in some more? I don't think there is. Um, if you have any questions on this, I wrote it a long time ago, but I'd be happy to work with it, work on it with you or talk you through it a little bit. Uh, if you have any questions, we can try to sort them out or whatever. Um, but like any good code, you know, it's missing a good deal of annotation. So, <laughs> so good luck. <laughs> have fun. It's got some, it's got a good deal of annotation here, more than most. Um, this stuff down here, the magnitude and phase plot, uh, we're going to get to that stuff here very soon. And boy, is it fun. All right, let's do some of the homework then. Let's dig right in. So for the homework, what we have is, uh, if I can make this smaller, it would be ideal. Oh boy, I'm playing, playing catch up here. So the first one is three over S plus two. And notice here that for the pull zero plot, I don't really care about that constant factor that's out front. We'll, um, we'll deal with that later, okay? We'll deal with that later. Um, yeah, don't worry about that too much for right now. It becomes important later on. All right, so the first one doesn't have any zeros at all, so I just leave that field blank. And then for my poles, I have S plus two. So my only pole is actually at minus two, so let's plot that. And you can see that there. Oops, shouldn't be there. Should, should have nothing at zero. Oh, there we go. Okay, it had some holdover from last time. Um, so yeah, there it is, it's right at negative two. Uh, and it has no imaginary component, so that's why it lives on this axis here. Okay. Clear as mud. All right, next one is uh, we have two complex conjugates of each other, this s squared plus 4. So I have uh, what should be, what is it, 2j and, and minus 2j. And in case you didn't know this yet, uh, J and I in MATLAB, unless you specify them as something else, will work as imaginary numbers as well. And there we go, uh, plus and minus two. What do you know? Pretty easy. Um, oh, we haven't talked about stability. So the first one was stable, obviously. Uh, 
nice real thing over here. Uh, this is what we call marginally stable, or or you could just say unstable, probably. Uh, I'm not sure what the solution manual has for it. Probably says that it is unstable. Would be my guess. Okay, so the book actually says that this is, in fact, um, marginally stable or Bebo unstable. It is Bebo unstable, in fact. Um, so it when you see the uh, real where it defines it as being stable or unstable, when it's talking about the RE, or the real portion of S, being equal to zero or less than zero, all that's doing there is it's just saying, hey, the real part of this is equal to zero, therefore it's at the margin. It's less than zero, therefore it's Bebo stable. It's greater than zero, therefore it's Bebo unstable, okay? All right, so the next one, we have two over two squared plus eight S plus 16. A uh, little bit of math here. You should be able to figure this one out pretty easily. Um, you're just going to have a double at four. So to do double roots, you just put them in twice. Isn't that nice? I really coded this for you. Oh, come on. you got to close the graphic before you can do a new one. There we go. So we have a double at four. And do we do the right? No, it's negative four. Sorry, negative four, negative four. All right, there we go. We've got them at negative four and negative four. That should do it. Um, that, seem, that seems like it would do the trick, I think. Yeah. Yeah, because you're going to get uh, 16 plus 16 minus 2 times 16, effectively. So perfect. And this would be a perfectly stable system. No issues there. Uh, the next one is, let's have a look-see. Uh, very similar problem. This is just with... Uh, negative two and and uh, that's gonna have a duplicity or multiplicity or order whatever you want to call it of two and then it should have one at uh, zero as well um, I said thought so oh unless I can't read no I thought that was a four I should make this why do I always do that let's make this big hey now I can see it okay so actually this, these are uh, complex right so these should be we end up with uh, one, one plus or minus, so minus one plus or minus three uh, J. As it turns out, if there was a four in the middle there, this totally would have worked. Okay, I swear. <laughs> All right, so minus uh, one minus three J. Yes, become a teacher, and you too can fumble up in front of everybody doing uh, doing coding examples. It's really most of coding. There we go. That's better. There. Okay, so you can see the two sets of poles we have here, the singular one at zero, and then these two off to here and here. Um, since we have this um, right at uh, right at the boundary here, this actually is gonna be Bebo unstable um, because we have the one that lies right on the imaginary axis. So even though you have some that are that are stable, just having even that one there is going to throw everything else off. Okay. So one bad apple spoils a whole bunch. All right, let's plug in uh, the next one, which is a little bit more interesting. It's got this. Uh, we finally get some behavior up here. Oh, we forgot to do our our zeros for this one too. What the heck, man? All right. There we go. That should just pop that right in there. There's our zero. It's right there at negative three. Okay. Um, we get to this example here finally. So let's do, we got our zeros at uh, plus minus 2j. And then we have this stuff here. So you see how easy this really is. You just solve away at this, plug in what you get. Uh, this one here, you can see combination. Uh, 3 times 5 gives you 15. 3 plus 5 gives you 8. Uh, pretty easy to factor this out. Negative 3, negative 5 get you your roots. Oops, I kind of close those plots. You should probably program that in there if you want. Uh, do uh, close, uh, close window or close whatever the heck the command is. Okay, so you can see here this one's a really interesting one. Um, this is totally unstable, right, because we have that uh, pole that's sitting out on this side of the plane, but if we didn't have that pole there, if we somehow canceled it out, right, then we could have a stable system. Um, so that's pretty cool. And our zeros are sitting right here on the imaginary axis because that's where they live.
And we forgot to put one in there. Whoops, we forgot the zero. Let's put that in there. There we go, boop. Okay, so that pretty much does it for that. Um, the other homework problem has you solving for trying to figure out what the value of k should be, which is going to be an interesting problem as uh, we move forward into frequency and magnitude scaling. Um, but I'll leave that one as an exercise for y'all, and uh, you can do it at your leisure. All right. Uh, it's been fun. It's been real. And uh, we'll get back to this thing later on. But other than that, we'll see you guys later.